Let me give it a second, get some people in here. All right, thanks everyone who, who's starting to hop on. Uh, just give a second here as we get ready to get started tonight. Give ourselves just another few seconds here before we get started. We're excited to have you and talk some UConn basketball, believe it or not. Less than a month away from the start of the season, which I know we're, we're all anxiously awaiting after not being in, allowed into the arenas last year, coming off a disappointing football season so far. So I know everyone's excited for basketball. So uh, guys, thanks so much for joining me again. I'm excited to bring you guys back. I think, what is this, third or fourth time we've done this? And it's always been a lot of fun. So thanks for coming on again. Well, we're always happy to ride in like the cavalry and save this flagging podcast. So. <laughs> I've been only been a partial participant for the last few times, so uh, hopefully I can stay the full uh, the full ride here. Yeah, it, as of now, you you've made it thirty seconds longer than you normally have, so uh, we'll... <laughs> good record. <laughs> I think by now everyone's well familiar with the group we've got on tonight. Uh, it's the it's the the beat writers that cover UConn men's basketball for us. So. Guys, I figured the best way to start, we've had some time now to digest all that happened last year. Looking back on that season and looking ahead to, to this year as well, what were your overall thoughts? Now that you, you could really think about what last year was like, it, thoughts on the team and how that will translate into some success hopefully this year for them. And Dom, we could start with you. Well, I mean, when I think back on last year, I just feel like uh, it was on schedule. I mean, third year, I mean, first year they looked a little better. Second year, they a little better results. Third year, they made the NCAA tournament. And that's – I don't think anybody expected much more than that, except to maybe maybe win one more game or two more games once you get in. But, I mean, they they if they had played a full season – they certainly would have won more than 20 games, um, you know, padding your schedule with the mid-majors and all of that stuff. And uh, what I thought for the, the games they were able to play and what they were able to to, to get in, in and around COVID, uh, you know, I thought they pretty much reached their goals. Now the goals are a little bit higher this year. You know, making the tournament's got to be a baseline achievement now. But but I thought for year three of, of the Hurley uh, rebuild, I thought they were on schedule. Neil, we'll go to you next. Yeah, I mean, you know, definitely a milestone getting back to the tournament. I mean, it had been, you know, a, a scant couple of years for some programs, but for a program that you kind of can still consider itself a blue blood and, you know, has the four titles in the last two decades, it was kind of a, a, a seriously uh, dry spell. So, yeah, getting there was a big accomplishment, but now it's almost passe. It's almost expected, like Dom said. I mean, you know, that's that's where you start and you go from there. You know, is is the is the big jump going to be, you know, a, a Sweet 16? Is it going to be even further? Is it going to be, you know, 23 wins? Is it going to be 26? It's 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 kind of uh, it's it's almost expected you're going to make another quantum leap this year. Now they're certainly capable, and you know they got the foundation for it, but it's it's a it's another question mark as they go forward. Gavin, we go to you on, on this one now. Yeah, I'm going to echo some of what these guys have said about the NSA tournament was a big deal getting there, breaking that drought. Uh, they really had to do that last year to be able to make another jump. And, uh, but they, you know, they still have a lot of work to do. I mean, they went 0-5 against the top three teams. I mean, they were third, but St. John's, uh, Villanova and Creighton, they went, they split with Seton Hall, the team that was below like fifth place. So that they still have to break through against the top teams in the league. And that's going to be part of making the next step this year. And like these guys said, now you, it's a little bit different being expected to make the NSA tournament. So a little bit different pressure there than, you know, just trying to get there for the first time. Dave, we'll wrap with you on this one. And I know you've got a, we'll, we'll cross promote it and give your podcast a shout out here too. I know you have an episode with Dan Harley, maybe something from talking with him, you know, as you look ahead to this year, basing off of what happened last year. Yeah. I mean, I agree that last year was certainly the, the step in the right direction. Uh, a big step up from year two. I think you could almost call it, um, maybe even a little bit ahead of schedule in the sense that 
especially when James Booknight was healthy there and toward down the stretch, they were playing as well as any team in the country for a while until it just came time to a slamming halt. And um, 45 or so. Right, right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, actually, and, and, and that's one other thing I, I would bring up about last year is that even though he's obviously not here anymore, James Booknight, the fact that they, that UConn uh, developed a kid um, two years on the on campus into a, uh, into a lottery pick, that really says a lot about um, the coaching staff, the program. Um, he's going to get his banner up on the um, the uh, practice wall. Uh, he's he's uh, he's wall. Uh, what's the state? What's uh, Hurley's um, wall? Uh, wall worthy. Wall worthy. Yeah, wall something like that. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that's a big thing for the program because uh, it shows that they can develop talent like that. Shows that they can recruit talent like that, and um, it's it's big for them moving forward. I know when we wrapped last season, one of the big questions on the minds of everyone was whether some of the players on the team might take advantage of that extra year they'd have this year uh, due to COVID. Were, were either any of you here surprised with either Isaiah Whaley or Tyler Polly coming back or both expected from your ends? Whoever wants, we, we could throw it out. Whoever wants to go on this uh, I think it's a, I think it was expected because, I mean, those two, you know, were obviously weren't ready to go to the NBA. They didn't really have uh, a pro option, whether that was overseas or anywhere else. So I think it was expected for them both to come back. And, you know, Tyler didn't have a healthy year last year and he needed to, to kind of, you know, make another step forward and be, have a healthy year. Isaiah still has some work to do if he's going to play somewhere after he leaves UConn. So I think it was pretty much expected. They both uh, needed this one more year. Yeah, I think both of them are kind of professional tweeners. You know what I mean? They're, they're, Whaley has some skills that are that are terrific, but he's not. He's certainly not an NBA five. You know, but he's not quite a, a polished four either. He he could get there. And and same thing with 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 Polly. I mean, he's a good shooter, but he's maybe not a great shooter for the next level. So another year benefits them both. You know, kind of an odd situation where I think non-COVID, there's more professional options for him, obviously, and and maybe they don't stick around. But, I mean, given the choices, I think it, it made a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, COVID shut down basketball really all over the world. And so there's a backlog of players playing in leagues everywhere in the world and there's not where, – where they weren't necessarily looking for new players out of college the way they normally are. So I think I think that, that was good. I, I didn't think – I don't think they had a viable pro option. If they did, they might well have opted to – you know, go make a living and move on from college. But, you know, I think, I think playing another, both of those guys sincerely love UConn. That's not a, yeah. that's not an act. I mean, they really do love UConn and want and, and wanted to come back, but I don't, I think it was their best option. Yeah. And Tyler Polly really intrigues me this year. I think that he could be sort of an X factor in the sense that last year he was obviously coming off the injury from the year before the surgery, um, ACL, um, didn't really have a great summer to because of COVID to kind of uh, rehab it. Um, uh, with, and with all the COVID pauses and stops last year was just tough for everybody, but especially for a guy coming off an injury. And, you know, other than a couple of big games that he had, um, it wasn't a great year for him, although he was the Big East uh, Six Man Award winner, which, yeah. you know, <laughs> the uh, competition wasn't terribly strong last year, but good for him for that. But I do think that um, a fully healthy Tyler Polly with a summer to – uh, you know, hone his craft and hopefully get better as a shooter. He could be a guy who really uh, is, is a key key player for them. Obviously, going to play better defense and rebound, but to be a guy who can stretch out uh, stretch out opposing defenses and be a real threat from three. I know we in, in, we talked a little bit about COVID being such a, a factor last year in terms of not being able to have games played and, and things of that nature. Heading into this season, have you guys gotten to take a look at? what the protocols are like for the team as if, you know, say a ref out there test positive, is it going to be something that causes games to be canceled or things along that line as they were last year? Or have, have those kind of restrictions gone away given the, you know, vaccine and all the, the advancements that have been made over the past, you know, several months? You know, I really haven't gotten any kind of a, an indication uh, of what they're doing, but it does seem like, um, if everyone's vaccinated, and I believe everyone involved with the team is vaccinated, uh, then if there is a breakthrough case, uh, other people could kind of test out of it. 
I mean, you saw with football, they had yeah. four or five cases. It didn't shut the whole team down. So, you know, I do. I, I think if they, I think if there is a, an isolated breakthrough case, uh, that they'll be able to deal with it without, without disrupting the, the the schedule the way they did, you know, this year. I mean, the way they did last year. I mean, that's my sense. But I, but as far as having any official guidelines of what they're going to do, I haven't seen that. All right. I, th- I think that that covers us on that one. And, and now we could start to talk <clears throat> about the season and the team. We, we've seen that non-conference and, and conference schedule are all out now. What were your initial thoughts on the non-conference schedule for this team? I know, you know, some fans upset about maybe not having a marquee home game in there, but you've got the games uh, at Atlantis. You've got the neutral site game against St. Bonaventure at West Virginia. What are your thoughts on that non-conference schedule and, and getting this team ready for conference play this year? And uh, Gavin, we could start with you. Well, I think you, what you pointed out about not having a, a, a really strong non-conference home game, uh, a big game. And, and they usually traditionally actually usually have them sometimes in January or early February, and that game's not there. So I think if I'm a fan, I'm looking at the schedule and, you know, for the home schedule, and, and I think they're missing that game. Uh, that, that tournament in Atlanta is going to be a great tournament. They could get three really good games. Of course, you never know how that's going to fall overall, but it's a strong field from top to bottom, so you should end up with at least a couple really good games there. So I think missing the home game, the good marquee home game, is, is probably the biggest hole in the schedule. Yeah, I think there's some some old-school RPI, or we'll call them net issues, with some of the lower teams bringing in. I'm, obviously, I don't. UConn doesn't expect to be a bubble team, doesn't expect to have to really – you know, scrounge around for, for points, for, for wins, et cetera. But, you know, your, your Gramblings and your Coppin States and your LIU is maybe not quite to the level that, that some fans hope. Even if you don't have one marquee home game, maybe you could have hoped for teams a little higher up in the, in the hierarchy, I suppose, if, you, if we're nitpicking a little bit. Well, you know, the, the whole – one of the big reasons that you wanted to go to the Big East as opposed, as opposed to the American – is because in the American was such a, a, a tough RPI conference uh, that they had to schedule up and they had to load up their, pre, their non-conference schedule with four or five uh, big time programs usually and usually weren't ready to play them, which per, which pretty much ended their season before it began uh, two or three years in a row. Uh, so at least they have a chance to kind of, Tune up and identify who they how their rotation before they get there, and then they've got 20 Big East games, you know, to kind of build up and toughen up for for the tournament. Yeah, I would. It would be nice to see one uh, really big marquee non non conference game, but I think that's an aberration. I don't think you'll see that every year. I think next year you'll you'll see one. And uh, at this point, um, you know, the the schedule is what it is. They're going to have to make make the best of it, not make sure they don't lose any of those games, first of all. And, you know, beat St. Bonaventure, uh, get a win at West Virginia, which would be a nice resume builder. And then they've got 20 games in the Big East to go to work. So, yeah, but, but, but yeah, as Gavin said, um, just to kind of get the juices flowing, it would be awfully nice to have like a Florida or a, or a Texas or a, a, or an Ohio state in here in, in, in December. Dom predicting undefeated non-conference schedule. <laughs> Got it. Just writing that down. <laughs> well, well you know, say, it, that, it, that's yeah. it's a pretty you know the the non the non-conference home schedule was it's, it's terrible. It's not yeah. it's not a single game on there that you know certainly like the average fan would be attracted to, and um, it's it's not good. But the overall non-conference schedule is pretty good. We mentioned Atlanta. I mean, all you know, people talking about, and myself included, that UConn could have one of the better front courts in the country this year. Well, so does Auburn. And you know, they got the kid Walker Kessler from North Carolina. They got a freshman who's probably going to be a lottery pick, Jabari Smith, the you know, seven-footer. They're going to be a really, really tough, uh, tough first opponent in Atlantis. And then you could get Michigan State or Loyola. We, we, well, you will get one of those two. Michigan State's always tough. Loyola's always tough. Um, and again, another a third good team there. West Virginia at West Virginia. Bob Huggins, great coach, and a lot of talent there. And St. Bonnie's. Let's not. And I mean, I mean, I know we already mentioned them, but St. Bonnie's is going to be really good this year. They were the best team in the A10 last year. They got everybody back. Um, 
They got a couple. They got a big man. Is one of the better defensive centers in the country. Six ten kid. Osun. Osing. Uh, I I knew I butcher his name, but um, a couple of kids actually went to Putnam Science Academy. So, um, what St. Mine's going to be? That's going to be a tough challenge too. So it's it's. And then you get the Big East schedule, which obviously there's going to be a lot of good teams there too. So, yeah, non-conference overall, pretty good schedule. Home, terrible. As we were talking about the Atlantis games, I've got to ask from a writing perspective for you guys. Better storyline if you get it in the championship game. Dan Hurley against Bob Hurley or another UConn-Syracuse uh, matchup there? Hurley, Hurley. Easy. And, and neither one of them want that. Both are they, – they, they, you know, they don't want that to happen. Um, but, it, you know, UConn-Syracuse, let's face it. And, I, and by the way, Syracuse – I think Syracuse is, a, is an underrated team this year. They're going to be able to shoot. The, they could be kind of the antithesis of a typical Syracuse. They're going to be able to shoot the ball really well with Nate Bayhide and the kid Joe Girard, and they got uh, the Villanova kid Cole Swider going over there now. They should really be able to shoot well. Their defense, however, <laughs> I'm not so sure about. But, um, yeah, UConn-Syracuse is always great. But to get the Hurleys going at it against each other uh, when neither one of them are going to want a coach in that game, uh, that, that would be really interesting. Yeah, it's probably the only uh, – Probably the only time you get that matchup outside of an NCAA tournament, it seems like. Yeah, no, Dan has said that, and, and actually Bobby has said it too that they they won't they don't think they would ever schedule each other in the regular season. Um, you know, the thing Arizona State's a little down this year, so you know UConn it could be a good matchup for UConn in terms of getting a quality win. But um, yeah, no, you wouldn't see that. Uh, you wouldn't ever see that other than like you said a, a tournament or NCAA tournament game most likely. So moving on to talking about some of the players on the team this year, I know it's a pretty familiar roster for anyone who watched last year with pretty much, you know, majority of the team back. I, I think one of the interesting things that the fans are looking for is who's going to replace that James Book Knight scoring. And I know that's the, the million dollar question there. I'm curious to get your opinions starting at the point guard position. We, we saw Jalen Gaffney come on hot a bit at the end of the year. We saw what RJ Cole can do. What are your thoughts on the two guards there starting uh, into the season here? And Dom, we could start with you. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think obviously they just need Cole to be Cole. They need him to do what he did last year. Uh, he could maybe score a little bit more, maybe shoot the ball a little bit better. His shooting percentage was down early, picked up late. But I think he's the solid guy. And in, in an ideal world, he he does what he did last year, and the other guys push him and push for more time. You know, Gaffney pushes for more time and maybe forces Hurley to get him, get him both on the court. Uh, and the Diggins pushes his way in. For more time, uh, but at you know at the very least, um, you know if you have an injury there, you've got one or two other guys who can who can you know run the floor you know be the field general. Whereas last year, as we saw, uh, with forty five seven to go in the season, uh, when um, Cole went down, they didn't really have another option on the floor. So I think they have more depth there. I think there'll be more competition. But I think if, if Cole can be Cole and the other two can push him, I think I, I think they should be well set at that position. Neil, we'll go to you next while your internet's good. <laughs> <laughs> Gavin is playing the role of uh, me this week. Uh, I was just about to say that exactly the same thing. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean I think I think what RJ Cole uh, gives you is hard to replace. Gaffney came on and made big strides, and he obviously looks uh, even better, you know, heading into the season. But it's it's RJ's job, and especially at the defensive end, I think that's sometimes overlooked. You know, UConn, even in their best years, have sometimes had some questionable perimeter defenders, and I think RJ Cole is, is very good. Um, and obviously that that's a big key. Dan Hurley always preaches he wants to get his guards up. He wants to, you know, even if he doesn't press, he wants to get a lot of pressure on. He wants to have a lot of deflections, a lot of hands and faces, et cetera. Uh, RJ Cole played very well defensively for most of the year, and – you know, the fact that he can give you a little more of a two-way player than Gaffney can at this point, you know, kind of makes him, you know, an easy choice. Um, but Gaffney shows a lot of flashes, has obviously a lot of ability, and they talked a lot last year about playing together. It didn't happen too often this past season, but who knows? You know, going small, you know, playing different lineups, you could see them together for a good stretch. Dave, any thoughts there? 
Well, yeah, no, I, I think Cole, you talk about a, a potential go-to guy with Book Night gone. I think it could be sort of a, you could go with a hot hand. You can, certainly, Sonogo is going to be a focal part of their offense. But I think RJ, I think Dan Hurley wants RJ to be sort of that guy um, and to kind of step up into that role. He's a good shooter. He's a great scorer, as he's, you know, as we saw um, prior to his UConn career. And uh, and last year, he certainly had his moments. He, he's a good three-point shooter. Um, struggled at times last year, but really came on strong towards the end of the year. So he's, now he's, uh, we talk about, Hurley talked about kind of there's only one or two guys who probably are, are all are set in their in their positions right now or as, as certain most likely starters. And I think RJ at point guard is certainly one. Jalen Gaffney is an interesting story. I mean, I'm interested to see what happens with him this year. He's going to be pushed a little more by some other guys. And, but, uh, you know, when you look at it, could, could he be the starting starting to guard um it, it's possible we'll see gavin you're back we'll get you while, while, while you're here uh, we're talking rj cole uh jalen gaffney any any thoughts on, on the the battle there for point guard there i think rj's got the edge I, you know one thing coach hurley talked about we saw them recently was that his biggest concern is his guard play uh he said we need to get consistent guard play this year so uh I think uh, as far as being consistent, RJ had a little rough start last year, but I think RJ's a more consistent player. And I mean, uh, Jalen showed, think, played well in spurts. You know, he had games here and there where he played really well, and then other games, you know, he wasn't that effective. So I think RJ has the edge, and I think he can make an, uh, you know, I think he averaged about 12 points last year. I can, I think he can, you know, get up to 14 or 15 this year. Speaking of replacing Book Knight and, and some of that athleticism, I know a guy everyone's excited to see, hopefully have a full season since he didn't last year, is, is Andre Jackson. What are, what are the thoughts on, on the role that he could play on the team this year? And Gavin, we could start with you on this one. You know, that's going to be really interesting because, you know, he's a great athlete who's yet to sh you know, really show his basketball ability yet. You know, we, he, has, he didn't shoot great last year he he had, you know it's not the dribble right now so he can he's one of those guys could really have a big sophomore year he's going to benefit for having the whole summer this time working out and being with the team which they didn't get going into their freshman year coach really talked about you know during covid you know the, the those freshmen going in didn't have that uh the, the, the hurley summer experience so he's going to have and that should help them out so yeah leave on a high note that's good so, that's yeah. good I like it. dave any thoughts there i mean gavin said it right off the bat athlete that that's what andre jackson is and you know great athlete um you know can be a really good uh defender um uh, rebounder uh Guy in man in transition. He's an excellent passer. I mean, there's, there's a talk about him ultimately being a point guard at some point in his career. Um, and we, and like Gavin was saying, we really didn't see the, the true Andre Jackson last year for a variety of reasons, a couple of injuries, the COVID shutdowns, pauses, and everything. Um, he's going to be a key element this year. If he can, and Dan Hurley kind of downplayed the, the idea that he needs to be a, a better three-point shooter, but um, he does certainly need to improve his, uh, his shooting range a little bit. Uh, to be really an, an offensive force, but he's a guy, he's a real, again, another X factor this season who can really um, uh, provide a lot of production for UConn. Neil, any thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, two big things he's got to obviously get better at. Two for 17 from three last year. I mean, that's that's obviously not not numbers that can then keep him on the floor. And the other one is he had 44 fouls in, you know, limited action, like 250-some minutes. I mean, that's that's – for all you old schoolers, that's like a Dan Cerulek rate. That's a lot of fouls. That's that's a lot of – got to work hard to commit that many. And, you know, he didn't get the greatest whistle, and, you know, freshmen don't. And he's got a little bit of Scott Burrell that he makes plays. He's so athletic that I think officials don't think he should be able to do that. You know, he makes a lot of, you know, plays in the air, and he's extremely skilled. But got to move his feet, got to stay out of foul trouble, and obviously has to shoot the ball better. Dom, last word on him. Yeah, I would just write – I kind of write off last year with him because, you know, not only was it not a typical summer, but he had the knee injury, so he didn't do anything at all in the summer. And then he had the wrist injury during the season. And the two for 17, you know, I mean, that's a small sample. 
You know, I don't think it's an indicative that he's a bad shooter. So, I, you know, I, he, obviously he has to, to shoot better than that. But, you know, too, I, I'm not ready to write him off as a shooter on, on 17 shots. But I, I, I'm fascinated by his passing ability. Uh, he, I mean, he really seems like he's, he's, he's a level above what you usually see in the college game. Uh, and, of course, he's a great athlete. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I would say he's the, if there's one guy on the team that has the, the potential for, like, a really big breakout, I mean, a big breakout, it would be him because he had such a, a limited freshman year that he could really explode onto the scene this year. I think he has that kind of talent. And he was you know, a guy they saw the minute this, this coaching staff assembled in Connecticut. He was a the guy they wanted for that reason. We know the bigs are, are going to be a big strength of the team this year. And I, I know one guy everyone's excited to see back out on the floor is a cook, a cook. Dom, what are your thoughts on, on what to expect from him this year? Because it seems like it's anyone's guess. Man of mystery. Um, yeah. yeah, you know what? I mean, all, all, all we could say there is that last year we really heard all year that he wasn't going to be himself because it was not 18 months removed from the Achilles surgery. Well, now he's well more than 18 months. Uh, he looks much, much bigger in the upper body. Um, so if you're going to – whatever a Cook's going to be, you're going to see it this year. If he's got the kind of talent, the NBA-type talent that they believe coming in that he had, now's the time that you should see it because he's got a you know, couple of years, three years really in the program – and, and he's healthy and strong. So, you know, we're going to have to see what it looks like. I mean, but, you know, the, the, the perception is that he should pick up where he left off when he injured his Achilles and be that much better and continue to get better. I mean, that's – so, yeah, he's a guy that, um, you know, he's got a lot of competition now that he didn't have his freshman year to get on the court. But, you know, by everything we've been told and everything, we you know, we, we, we see – which is not much because we're not in there looking at much. Uh, he's healthy. Dave, I'll go to you if, if you've got any thoughts on a cook here. Yeah, and no, I was actually going to say that, keep in mind, we haven't really seen these guys uh, we all throughout the summer and in, even into this uh, preseason here. We, Other than about 10, 15 minutes of the guys shooting around after practice, uh, after the first practice a couple of weeks ago. But the reports that we've seen and heard of, of a cook are good. Uh, that he's 100% back. Um, you know, a couple of video clips, he's looked good. He's swatted away some shots and uh, take what you want from that. But that's you know, obviously he looks good, looks healthy. Um, I keep saying this, but there's because there really are so many X factors for this team, but he's another one. I mean, if, if they can get the kind of defensive production, uh, the rim protection that he gave them as a freshman and uh, can also stretch out defense a little bit, hit it, I, think he's, I think he's a better shooter than maybe he's, he's shown so far. Um, again, what a what a huge uh, addition to the team he'll be. We'll, we'll switch it up and, and go to another guy in the in the front court there, and, and that's Adama Sanogo. We we saw what he was able to do to, as a freshman. Neil, what are you expecting from him making that jump from freshman to sophomore year this year? Yeah, I mean, all signs are that he's going to be the next UConn big. Uh, I mean, you know, the coaching staff expects it. NBA draft people expect it. I mean, it looks like. He has the skills, he has the the mindset, the drive, et cetera, to, to really be a great college basketball player. I mean, you know, he's physically he's intimidating. You know, when you look at even when he stepped on, on campus last year, I mean, just a, a large man and excellent feet, excellent feet for a big man, you know, good hands. Really, I think he has a, you know, Dan uh, has talked about extending everybody's shooting range, all of his big men. But I think he's got a, he's got a, a decent range already. And, you know, he can hit from the outside. Obviously, doesn't have any big moment nerves. I don't know what that is or why that is. You know, some freshmen come in a little bit deer in the headlights. Adama didn't seem to have that at all. I mean, you know, he made mistakes, but everybody does and all freshmen do. But really seems to have a feel for the moment and a feel for, you know, important possessions and, and key points in games. And I think, you know, he's going to, I don't know, what were his numbers last year? Something like seven and five. I mean, I think both of those numbers could, could almost, could easily double. You know, obviously there's going to be a lot of competition for playing time in the front court, but I don't think, I don't see how you can sit him for very long. Yeah. Uh, did we lose? Oh, 
Gavin, you there? There you are. We, we oh, got okay. two Gavins. We got two Gavins. Um, Gavin, uh, can you hear us? We'll get three and talk to the one in the middle. I can, <laughs> for now. <laughs> Oh, okay, well, well, we've got you. If you're looking for Adama Sonogo, if you're looking for one thing in his game to, to see improve from last Bucks, year to this year, what, you what's that? still talking about Sonogo? Yeah. Okay, so... Can you hear us? Bro- oh. Bro- <coughs> you know, Adama was so productive last year. Seven- yes. Adama was so productive last year. Only play- average... He still 7.3 points, 4.8 re- He was tremendous, and I think he's going to be great this year. This to him... And, uh, I mean, I think, you know, he could be, you know, this could be his last year at UConn if he has a big year. He's got so much upside, and the kid works hard. And, uh, I mean, the, the thing is he's got to stay out of foul trouble with him. That's what that was his problem last year. He's got to stay on the court longer. And when teams go small, can they stay on the court too? Can they keep him on the court? So that will be interesting to find out. Dave, I'll, I'll throw another question mark your way. We, we saw him play a couple minutes last year. Here he is in year three at UConn. Can we expect anything from, from Richie Springs? Is, is he going to be hitting the court? You know, it's uh, it doesn't look like it off the bat. I mean, um, just talking to Dan yesterday, uh, talking about the front court, Richie was – he almost forgot to mention him and kind of then he mentioned him as a guy who could see some playing time. Uh, he's got some real tough – he's got some real – veterans and, and talent ahead of them on the depth chart, it seems. And we're, of course, Samson Johnson, the freshman, some of them expect big things from too. And he might be um, sort of above uh, Richie in the pecking order too. I mean, I got to believe you'll see Richie at some point, particularly early in the season, just to see what he can do, see what he can give them. Um, it's really interesting though. And, uh, but, you know, as we sit here right now, it's, it's kind of hard for me to see Richie really being a big contributor at all this season. <laughs> Dom, we'll, we'll let you close out kind of the, the known guys on, on the front court there. You know, we, we've all seen what, what Isaiah Whaley can bring to the court. What are you expecting from him in, in his last year here? Well, you know, you know, you rarely, I don't know, have we ever seen a guy play five full seasons? I mean, uh, he, he's, uh, I mean, he's going to be kind of the, the veteran granddad of, of the group. But, you know, I, I think very often he's, he should be, he should be a man among boys because he's he's so much older. He has so much game experience behind him, uh, and he does so many things well. Uh, particularly, you know, the ball screen defense and all those things that Dan Hurley talks about all the time. And and he's and he's a, and he's a better offensive player. Seems like he gets better all the time. So, you know, I, I think he's going to be, um, you know, I mean, and in a way, when you talk about Richie Springs, I mean. In a sense, his presence probably is going to hold some guys back from getting minutes. But I think you, the byproduct of that is UConn's going to get extraordinary experience at that position on the floor. Neil, I'll kick off this one with, with you. In terms of looking at, at the freshman class coming in this year, who do you expect to play a, a big role from that group this year? Well, I mean, I think Samson Johnson – maybe at first plays the most, although it's hard to say with such a, a talented front court. But I think I think Jordan Hawkins is the one that is kind of the heir apparent. And he's kind of the the next star, the next, you know, Yukon wing that that they hope dominates. Maybe a la Book Knight, but something something akin to that. Uh, a lot of skill, a lot of confidence. Um, could play, you know, almost anywhere, had almost of his pick of schools. I mean maybe not the top, top, top um but chose to come to UConn and probably because you know he knew he could play soon if not right away and could contribute significantly right away so I mean I don't think he's going to start initially but I wouldn't be shocked if he's in the starting lineup by by midseason I think it's an interesting one so we'll, we'll go around the horn with this one Dave your thoughts on the freshman uh, class coming in yeah I agree with uh Neil on, on I think Jordan um might be the best of the bunch uh well Samson Johnson might end up be end up being sort of the, the guy with the, the best career, but um, but Jordan's got maybe the most talented of the three, uh, shooter and, and an athlete. It's a nice mix to have. Uh, needs to work on his ball handling a little bit. Needs to work on his defense, like like most freshmen. Uh, defense is usually something that comes a little later, but uh, I think he can have a, certainly a, a, a maybe even a big impact. Again, probably 
more not maybe not to start the season, but more midway through to the end of the year, he could be a guy who they really rely on as, a, as an outside shooter and a scorer. Um, Samson Johnson again is a guy who's going to provide length, rim protection, can stick a three. All accounts, he's going to have a, he's going to you know be a big contributor this year. Rasul Diggins, it sounds like might have the toughest time earning playing minutes this season, but uh, I think you'll see him, and I think uh, UConn fans are going to like him because he's got a lot of uh, a lot of foot spot. Dom, uh, we'll, we'll go to you on this one, but I want to throw out a name that we, we haven't heard from either Dave or Neil yet, and that's uh, one of our guys who, who reclassified in, in Corey Floyd and in, in what you're expecting, if any role from him this year. Well, you know, I, I know that very a very short time before he reclassified, you know, Dan Hurley made a point of saying that if we do take on anybody new, it's going to have to be someone who red shirts. So uh, I think that that's probably their plan going in, but they don't want to remove the goal from him mm -hmm. of, of playing himself into it. I think they want to kind of keep the way open in front of him and see what he does, see if he does play himself into, into some kind of a role. But I think, I, I think the idea there being is basically that, hey, if, if, he, if he forces us to play him, Okay, then so much yeah. the better. We're a much better team. If not, he can redshirt a year and develop and be ready to play his plan next year. So I think I think that's the the way I would look at it with him. I think if 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 he plays at all, it's going to be either because a lot of guys get hurt, which is a bad thing, or because he's really forced them uh, to do something that they were not expecting to do. Good thing. Uh, but as far as the other guys, yeah, I, th I think uh, uh, Diggins is, is going to be a really great UConn player, but he's got a lot in front of him right now. Uh, Samson Johnson is a guy that people have talked about as being maybe one of the most talented players on the whole team, but he's got a lot in front of him, and he's going to have some developmental work to do. Jordan Hawkins, the, the, the way is open, the route's open. I think there are minutes available for him. There's the need for the next book night to step in. And, and he's got, you know, the, the 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 pedigree to do that. So I think he has the best chance to play a major role as a freshman. But I wouldn't. This is a this is a freshman class that has a lot of people excited. I wouldn't rule out any of these guys playing a big role. All right, as we start to to wrap here, I've got some kind of lightning round questions we could, we could go around the horn with. And, and Dom, we could start with you on this one and work our way around here. If you had to pick a guy that's going to make the biggest leap from last year to this year, who are you taking? Yeah, Andre Jackson, for reasons I spelled out a little bit earlier. I mean, I won't repeat myself, but I just think he's got a tremendous skill set um, and can really be a dynamic player now that he's healthy and he's maybe got his legs under him. Dave? Well, I mean, I agree with Andre Jack. There's a cook count. I mean, uh, certainly didn't do much last year. Uh, if, if we're counting a guy who can really uh, step up his production for what he did last year, which again was barely anything for obvious reasons, um, I'll go with a cook. And I agree with Andre Jackson, but I'll, I'll just say a cook. Neil? I think the, pro the answer probably is Andre Jackson, but I'll take Sonogo just to uh, be a contrarian and to, uh, and to pick one original. Um, I think his his numbers are obviously going to go up, and they could go up significantly. Talked earlier how the the million dollar question is who's going to replace Book Knight's scoring. If you had to guess the the leading scorer, Neil, we'll start with you on this one. Who's your pick? R.J. Cole. Dave. You, you kind of got to go with a guard, right? I mean, I'm tempted to say Sonogo, but uh, I'll I would say R.J. Cole. Yeah. Dom. I'll I'll hit a fungo out there and say Jordan Hawkins. All right, all right, interesting. Well, it, it just hit me as we've been, been kind of going through all the names here. No one's brought up Tyrese Martin yet. No, no, Dom, and, and right. didn't I didn't have this as a as a lightning round one here. But thoughts mm -hmm. on him uh, heading into the year? Just a very good, solid player. Uh, a, you know, a little bit like Whaley, uh, a guy with a lot of experience, a guy that uh, that I think is going to be very much a steadying force. Uh, and I think it's just great to have him there as a guy who sets the standard for the young guys to have to beat, to have to, to have to pop to get on, on the court. So I, I think he's going to be just a really, he's probably going to be a guy that we take for granted 
like we just like we have the last 45 minutes. <laughs> but it was going to be a very important a very important factor. Either of you, Neil or Dave, have any thoughts on, on Tyrese? I mean, I think very few players in the roster regret the 4507 more than 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 he does. And he knows he didn't play well in that final game and a half. And I think he wants to make up for it. And you know, there's a lot to be said for what what fuels somebody and if you can use that properly and use it as motivation, who knows? You know, could uh, start with a bang this year. Yeah, I almost want to change my mind and say he could be the uh, the biggest jump in, in terms of statistics. Although <clears throat> he averaged 10.3 and seven point with a leading rebounder at 7.5 last year. Um, excellent rebounder, but the scoring average can certainly go up if he just <laughs> hits his point blank shots better and is is better on the rim, which is a big problem for him last year. Well, you got to pick okay. a Rhode Island guy, Dave. You got to stay on brand. <laughs> He's not from Rhode Island. Yeah. <laughs> you you mentioned him uh, as a leading rebounder there. That that was my next lightning round here. And Neil, we could start with you if you had to take a pick on, on leading rebounder for this year. Sonogo. Dave. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna say um, I'm gonna say Tyrese Martin again. All right, Dom. Yeah, I think it'll be Martin again because I think he'll be on the floor, you know, maybe more than some of the other guys. All right, and we'll go in. Who who's this year's book night in terms of the guy that you could see leaving early to hit the draft? And Dom, we'll, we'll start with you on that one. Oh, that, yeah, that's got to be Sonogo. He's got to be the best, uh, the the best candidate, the, the most likely candidate for that. That's not saying he's a very likely candidate, but I would think he's the most likely candidate to to rise to that level. I suppose a Cook. Too, if he really, you know, becomes what they thought he was going to become, but I would say, if if I were a, a betting man, which is legal now in Connecticut, yeah. I, know <laughs> uh, I would probably say Sonogo. Dave. Yeah, Sonogo, especially if we're talking about in the next year's NBA draft. Um, you know, at some point you could see a Cook as a pro. Um, certainly, Andre Jackson maybe in in a, in a couple of years uh, has the talent, and the freshman like you mentioned, Jordan Hawkins, and. And Samson Johnson, um, all those guys could certainly at some point uh, be in the NBA. But if we're talking about the 2022 draft, Sonogo. Neil, you you, you going to make it a three's a company? Yeah, I'd love to disagree with my colleagues, but I cannot. Uh, yeah, Sonogo has, has all the skills and shows all the signs that he could make a big jump and could be ready to leave at the end of the year. No no guarantees, of course, but he he might be. All right, I haven't started one with you, Dave, in the middle, so you, you could get first stabs at this one. We, we saw today – be easy. <laughs> this is a fun one. We, we saw today Val Ackerman talk about how the Big East could possibly be open to expansion when, when the deal with Fox is up. But do you have a school or two you could see being on the Big East radar when it comes time to, to look at realignment? Well, you know, everyone wants to take on Zaga, right? Um, but to me, that just seems – the travel issue would be too way too much. Um, uh, you know, I I've always liked Dayton. Uh, great fan base there. We all know how they sell out the first four every year, and um, uh, it's been a pretty good program. Um, you know, I don't know if Xavier would be too crazy about them joining. Uh, you know, people will laugh at this, but Wichita State doesn't have a doesn't have a football program, right? Um, and that's that's traditionally a pretty good program. Um, so that's another one, uh, you know, again, travel, but you certainly got Creighton out there and, 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 and Butler and whatnot. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, those are three. I'm sure there's, I'm sure these guys will come up with some good ones as well. Dom, yeah, any, any, anyone? Mary? Yeah, I mean, we, Wichita State uh, makes a lot of sense to me because they kind of got into the American in part because UConn was there. Uh, and also it will be a travel partner for Creighton, you know, somebody in the neighborhood – of Creighton and they're a place that like the Big East, they fill out, they fill up their arena all the time. So they would, I would think would be a, an, an attractive uh, possibility. Maybe Virginia Commonwealth would be uh, an attractive possibility. I mean, they, um, uh, they certainly, uh, you know, have, have, the, have the pedigree in the program and they would give the Big East uh, some reach into that, into that part of the, the country. And, you know, I think maybe just, just, just to make our lives miserable, maybe East Carolina. Who knows? 
And Neil, before I, I let you answer, I know mm -hmm. uh, you know fun thing that's been going on is, with UConn Twitter is trying to push Kansas to go the UConn route of <laughs> independent in football and, and Big East basketball. Um, any of you see that as, as a possibility? No, no. But <laughs> it's fun to think about, I suppose. Uh, it's entertaining, and uh, but no. <laughs> I mean, you're giving up Power Five money. Yeah, it may not be as much as the other Power Five conferences, but why would they do that? It would make no sense to me, unless the big, unless the the Big Twelve starts to, yeah, yeah. But then no, you the, big, the Big Twelve is the best basketball conference in the country right now. Yeah, um, and you know, in the Big East, for all we talk about it, it's a very good conference. But um, as we all know, it's certainly not the old Big East, and. Uh, um, you know, last year would have been a what a, 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 a three bid league if, yeah. if not for uh, Georgetown's run. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't see that with Kansas. But I, I've given up on predicting what's going to happen with conference yeah, realignment yeah, yeah. because it's mm -hmm. so, or even what the entire college land, collegiate landscape is going to look like um, in the future. It's just so hard to predict. Yeah, I think Dayton is a decent possibility, though, that we talked about. I, th I think you know, <laughs> geographically, it's a reasonably good fit. You know, basketball pedigree, it's a pretty good fit. Fan base, it's good. And there's the Oliver Purnell connection that just can't be ignored. So, <laughs> yeah, I'll let you know. There we go. That could be interesting. Going up to. He beat, he beat uh, didn't he beat, he beat UConn out in uh, Hawaii or something one year, right? Yes, he did. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you start with this one. Uh, taking UConn and Villanova outside of the the question here, who, who's another Big East team you think could be, you know, competing towards the top at, outside of UConn and Villanova? Uh, Xavier, I think, is probably uh, right there. Um, you know, it, it's so hard because we haven't seen anybody play, any, obviously, and, you know, uh, even seen some practices. But I think I think Xavier has all the tools. I, I'm, I know it's crazy given what they lost, but I think Seton Hall, maybe. So, yeah, that's my that's my best guess for so far. Dave, I'm big on Xavier. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna vote for them in my, my uh, top 25 ballot next week. And uh, uh, with with Fremantle and Scruggs, uh, that, that's a pretty good one-two punch there. And they were a team that was really racked by uh, COVID last year as well. With a lot of you know, I think they only played like 12 or 13 games, something like that. I think I, I like Xavier a lot. Um, I think uh, Teen Hall. Lost a lot, but they got a couple of you know. They got we all know uh, well Kadari Richmond from Syracuse and. Um, the kid from uh, South Florida, Alexis Yetna, who we know yeah. pretty well. Oh, yeah. It, those are two very good additions for Seton Hall. They should be good. We'll see how they all mix together. Butler's got their entire starting five back. Now, they were bad last year, but I think Butler's going to be a top five or six team. And um, St. John's uh, has their two best players back. They lost pretty much everybody else. <laughs> and uh, there's a little bit of controversy going on with uh, coach right now, but um, they should be tough, too. Dom? Yeah, you know, I know we all, I guess we've all been waiting every year. Every year is going to be the year St. John's uh, comes back and make and, and it's St. John's of old. Uh, you know, I think this could be the year that that happens. Uh, as Dave mentioned, they got their two best players back, which is a pretty good place to start. And then they got some key recruits too, some big time recruits coming in. So I think, I think St. John's will be, and of course, Xavier, you know, on paper, you can't ignore them and what they've done and, and, and what they are. So th those two for sure. And, you know, the, it's not crazy to think Seton Hall is going to be good because Willard's got a program where, you know, he's got kids waiting in the wings mm -hmm. while, you know, he's, he's got that kind of, of conveyor belt thing going with his talent like Villanova does. So I think he probably has kids waiting in the wings ready to step up into roles that they couldn't play last year because of the guys they had. So th those three would make a lot of sense to me. Dave, I've got to ask, since you mentioned your your top 25 ballot there, can you give us a little bit of a preview as to where UConn may or may not be on that list? Yeah, uh, it's it's tough. I mean, you, it's hard to overlook the loss of Book Night. Um, but you look at everything that they've got back, which is everybody else for the most part, every, every major, major contributor, I think 78% of their scoring or whatever it is, and um, three really good freshmen. Uh UConn's going to be in there because I think they're going to probably I, – I would pick them to finish second in the Big East ahead of Xavier. So if I'm going to have Xavier in there, I, I guess i got to have UConn in there as well. 
Neil, I'll let you start on, on this final question here. And, you know, it's preseason. It's time for your your wildest, tottest takes. So, you know, if you had to have one take on, on this UConn team heading into the year, what is it? Uh, this UConn team will win at Villanova. Oh, I like it. All, all, now, I'm not saying they're not going to go, you know, 5-15, and 15, but <laughs> I think, I think, yeah, for a variety of meaningless reasons, I think uh, they're going to spring an upset there. Dave, your turn. Yeah, I'll say, uh, gee, I, I should have thought of the, about this earlier because uh, I knew you'd spring this. Because I think last spring I said uh, Richie Springs would be the surprise player this year, and I, I kind of <laughs> negated that a few minutes ago. But um, I will say that, uh, just keeping with the Villanova theme, I will say that UConn will be battling it out with Villanova to the very last week of the season for the top spot. I think Villanova deserves to be the number one team in the league. They'll, I'm sure they'll be picked and finished first by the coaches next week. Maybe even unanimously. Well, they'll have to be one other team, whoever Jay Wright votes for. But um, uh, I'm, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't concede the Big East regular season title of Villanova. And I think UConn will be um, fighting them for it. Uh, and you know, and there's a slight chance that they could even win it. But uh, they'll be fighting for, with for that uh, number one spot up until the final week of the season. I bet. All right, Dom, your turn. You're best for last year. You got to give us the hottest one. Yeah, and you know what? I'm not a hot take guy, as you know. I'm more of a voice of reason guy. <laughs> but I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to say that UConn stays on schedule and year four on schedule, Sweet 16. So I say UConn's playing. I mean, man, I guess that's not a, a, a scalding hot take. <clears throat> but, I, I think UConn, a... but I think UConn's a Sweet 16 team this year. Yeah, it's a, a vintage Damamori take there. So we'll, we'll 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 take that one. Well, guys, I, I really appreciate you joining me. I, Gavin shot me a note, uh, unfortunately, with him hopping on and off. Uh, he wasn't able to get back on here. But we do want to wish him a happy birthday. We've got Gavin's birthday tomorrow. So happy birthday to Gavin. Uh, sorry sorry, the internet didn't uh, work out tonight. Maybe get a, get a modem tomorrow. But uh, – yeah, my hot take is my hot take is Gavin's. Uh, next time we do this, Gavin's internet will be a lot better. Yes, yes, yes. Because we we hopefully will be doing this all in person come the spring to wrap things oh, up. Uh, right. Yeah, so so we won't have to worry about any internet. But guys, really appreciate the time. Thanks so much for coming on uh, and enjoy the season we've got coming up. Thanks for having us. Right. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.